Welcome everyone to the Texocity series presented by the 210 Culture Podcast. My name is Donna and I am your host. And uh, today's episode is actually quite interesting. We will be talking about the Oak Hill Satanic Ritual Abuse Trial that happened in 1992. A couple named Dan and Fran Keller were charged with 48 years in prison after being accused of repeatedly and sadistically abusing several children at their daycare in Austin, Texas. Over the course of the 80s and 90s, many women were beginning to enter the workforce, leaving their children behind in daycares. Apparently, daycare sex abuse hysteria was a panic a lot of parents had, and in the early 90s, charges against daycare providers of several forms of child abuse, including satanic ritual abuse, became an unfortunate trend. Even before Dan and Fran Keller were charged, about a hundred child care workers across the country had been charged with ritual sex abuse of children, and 20 daycare workers had been convicted of similar cases. We are deep diving into this case, and it's a bit interesting, but it's a bit, you know, I might have left some parts out just because I kind of wanted just to focus on um, Dan and Fran Keller. Fran and Dan Keller had only been married for about a year when they moved into a ranch-style brick home on Thomas Springs Road, northwest of the Y in Oak Hill. They had been living in an apartment, but Fran, who said to be a country girl at heart, wanted to find something out of town. I like gardens, and I like animals, she said. I just wanted some place in the country. The couple was able to find a three-bedroom home owned by Julia Dietz. D-I-E-T-S. I am recording this at close to midnight. <laughs> I can't fucking read after 1130. I'm sorry. Who has remained friends with the Kellers? Okay, so before I continue this case, I'm sorry I didn't disclaim it in the beginning. But disclaimer, there is child sex abuse allegations in this case. So if this is a trigger warning in case you don't want to listen to it, you don't have to listen to it. You can just listen to my other ones like Bailey says. Viewer discretion is advised. So the couple leased the home on July 1st, 1988. Dan was a manager at the county's Precinct 3 road crew and Fran was working at HB. Fran's former boss was pregnant and had just given birth to a son when Fran decided that she didn't want to work for HB and began taking care of him while Fran's former boss was at work. It wasn't long before Fran started taking in other kids, as she was referred to her by friends and neighbors. Eventually, she put a sign up in the front yard advertising her services. It was wonderful. I taught kids how to garden, Fran said, and we had a big backyard and we bought a pool for the kids and we had sand all over the years. We built one of those big wooden gyms. We had a house and the kids would take rides on the horse. Fran was thrilled. She always loved kids. Fran had three grown children from a previous marriage, and Dan had four children from a previous marriage as well. Together, they had seven grandchildren. By 1991, Dan had retired and decided to help Fran tend to the kids and his property. Dan would take them out for rides on horses, pulling them in a large wagon behind his riding lawnmower. Everything seemed great. Fran always had extra clothes she would buy from Goodwill in case kids would soil themselves or get too dirty. And her stern and good-hearted personality had people coming back. At the time, daycares would not accept children with emotional and behavioral problems. But Fran's daycare did. That included those who had been abused. Fran's daycare would have about 15 kids in attendance each day. In the summer of 1991, Fran cared for a three-year-old girl named Christina Chaviers, daughter of Suzanne and Rick Chaviers. I'm mispronouncing names, so sorry. Rick and Suzanne Chaviers were currently going through a bitter divorce, with Suzanne accusing Rick in court of physically and emotionally abusing Christina which he denied. Suzanne sought daycare for Christina so she could have a place to take her daughter while she ran errands related to the divorce. Fran 
although aware of the behavioral issues that Christina was experiencing, decided to take Christina in her daycare. Christina had rarely been away from her mom's side. At the time she began dropping Christina off at daycare, Suzanne began taking Christina to see a therapist, Donna David Campbell. According to the therapist, Christina's behaviors were among the worst that she had ever seen. Christina had been acting out for months, long before she began attending Fran's daycare. It is said that two weeks at the daycare and Christina was almost unmanageable at home. She would bite, scream, kick, pull Suzanne's hair, destroyed things, even tried to stab the dog with a barbecue fork. A la verga. <laughs> oh, hell no. She would behave like a dog, eating and drinking from a bowl and defecating in the backyard. She would insert toys into her vagina, mostly marbles and crayons, and was already using rough language, including the phrase, but fuck. <laughs> I laughed at the word. It was so fucking childish. <laughs> Fran quickly learned that Christina was a liar and a manipulator who would attack other children and accuse them of attacking her. Suzanne hardly would try to discipline Christina, having been advised by a previous therapist against, quote, setting limits, unquote. Hell no. Spank that child. Spank her. Dan would assist Fran with making toys for the children, bows and arrows, Indian drums, capes on which he painted like the Ninja Turtles, Dan would sometimes even hitch a trailer to his riding lawnmower and give the kids rides around the property with Dan's pony dancer prancing behind. Most of the kids enjoyed riding, except Christina. Christina complained after her first day that the horse frightened her. Suzanne told Fran and Dan to keep Christina away from the horse, which they tried to do. Christina was considered a drop-in. She attended Fran's daycare a total of 13 times, between May 8th to August 15th, 1991. One day, while en route to an appointment with her therapist, Christina told Suzanne that she didn't like Dan. Suzanne asked her why, and Christina said that he had hurt her. Dan had hurt Christina and pulled her panties down and spanked her, and he pooed and peed on her head. Suzanne decided not to ask too many questions, quote, because I didn't know how to handle that exactly and figured that we were going to counseling and that was the best place to handle all of whatever she had to say, unquote. During the session, David Campbell brought out a pair of anatomically correct dolls for Christina so she can show David Campbell and Suzanne what Dan had done to her. After Dan defecated on her head, she said, Fran washed it out quote, unquote, with blue shampoo, then said Dan, quote, had taken a writing pen and put it up her, unquote. Christina would then point to the hole on the female doll that represents a vagina and started showing them where the pen had gone. Suzanne and David Campbell had asked Christina if this was one time, and Christina answered no. Suzanne says, quote, she started counting on her fingers, lots of times. Started going one, two, three, four, five, unquote. That night, Suzanne says that she heard Christina crying in the bathroom. Christina would then tell Suzanne that it, quote, unquote, hurt inside when she urinated. Christina kept pointing to her vagina and contorting her labia to make her genitalia look like a face. She said that Dan taught her that. Christina would also say that there was glue stuck inside her. She said, quote, Dan took his pee-pee and put it in her hole and got glue all stuck inside and all over her, and it was yucky, unquote. Suzanne, in a panic, like any other parent, calls the doctor and rushes Christina to Brackenridge Hospital. Dr. Michael Moo, I'm just going to call him Moo, was on duty in the Brackenridge emergency room when Suzanne and Christina had arrived just after 11 p.m. Moo had evaluated approximately 30 children who were suspected victims of sexual abuse, but was not specialized in that area. Suzanne explained to Moo what was happening and Moo tested for semen, but had found nothing. 
Mu did, however, find that Christina's genitalia was red and noted, quote, what appeared to be lacerations to the hymen at three and nine o'clock, unquote. Under defense questioning, Mu testified that the injuries could have been the result of Christina's own action as well. Ooh, this is already starting a fucking mess, man. A fucking mess. I don't know how I would react if my child would tell me that shit. I would probably fucking kill whoever she was accusing of that was doing that to her. Seriously. So there was two other kids that would accuse the Kellers of similar accusations. According to the children, the couple would serve blood-laced Kool-Aid and force them to have videotaped sex with adults and other children. The Kellers would often wear white robes and lit candles before hurting them. The children would also accuse the Kellers of forcing them to watch or participate in killing and dismemberment of cats, dogs, and a crying baby. Bodies were unearthed from cemeteries and new holes dug to hide freshly killed animals and once an adult passerby was shot and dismembered with a chainsaw. The children also recalled several plane trips, including one to Mexico, where they were sexually abused by soldiers before returning to Austin in time to meet their parents at the daycare. Okay, so while looking up and researching this case, and when I was typing this out, I was like, I'm sorry, but how could half of this shit be true? How could they plan a trip to Mexico and be able to return to Austin in time to meet the parents at the daycare? At that point, it was kind of like, okay, this is starting to be a little bit of an exaggeration. But apparently it was the 80s and 90s and people were fucking weirded out about satanic rituals and shit like that. So they thought it was some supernatural Satan crap going on. One of the other children who accused the Kellers of abuse was Vijay Stalin, who had told his mother that Dan had made him eat poop and drink pee. Vijay's father said that he and his wife suspected that Vijay was being drugged by the Kellers. Quote, he'd come home like he had been drugged, with rings around his eyes, unquote. Vijay's mom reported that Vijay would see pee-pee on hair and that Dan did it. Vijay would also tell his mother that Dan had put a rope around all the children's necks and said he would, quote, cut Vijay's head with a knife, unquote, if he told any secrets. The other child that accused the Kellers of abuse was Brendan Nash. Brendan would say that the Kellers had held a gun to his head and forced him to assault his infant sister while they videotaped the abuse. According to Brendan's mom, they were, quote, secrets at Fran and Dan's house, unquote. Brendan's mother even told the TV show American Justice in 1993 that the Kellers, quote, had chopping knives and they tied Brendan's arm down and told him to lay with his arm out and to close his eyes and they made a big chop down with a knife, unquote. Quote, and they told him not to look, that Dan Keller had chopped his arm and that they took out the bone and they put Satan's bone in its place. Unquote. Ooh. So this took place around August of 1991. Roger Wade, who was the department's only child abuse investigator at the time, would receive the case of the allegation that Christina Chavers had been sexually abused at Friends Daycare. Wade immediately thought of Mick Martin Preschool case, which was a notorious case in California with similar accusations. Wade then decided to visit Christina, Suzanne, David Campbell, and called in Karen Knox to sit down with Christina for a forensic interview, a 13-minute session that produced mixed results. Knox would videotape three separate interviews with Christina. During the first two, Christina was distracted and unable to speak. On the third interview, Knox began asking, open-ended questions, but ultimately asking leading questions. At one point, Knox asked her what Dan Keller did to her, and Christina replied, you tell me. Wade called in a state child care licensing investigator, and both went to visit Dan and Fran. They were told about the allegations of sexual abuse, and the couple denied any wrongdoing. Fran would tell Wade that she was worried about the allegations Christina was making as she was a troubled girl 
whom she'd catch in several small lies. Wade expressed to Dan there was medical evidence that showed the girl had been molested. Dan denied he had done anything and, quote, continued to say that he did not abuse any kids and that anyone who would should be shot and put out of their misery, unquote. Wade advised Dan and Fran to not have any contact with the children while the investigation was going on. Wade would then speak to David Campbell, who told him what Christina had told her and Suzanne and what she had demonstrated with the dolls regarding what Dan and Fran had done to her. More allegations began to accumulate as Wade spoke with Brendan Nash and Vijay Stalin, who had similar allegations against Dan and Fran. The daycare officially shut down the first week of September, and in November 1991, an arrest warrant was issued. The Kellers, who were so in denial of the allegations, agreed to voluntarily surrender, but then panicked and fled to Las Vegas, where they were arrested January of 1992. In March 1992, Austin police officer Larry Oliver began investigating Christina's claims relating the cemeteries. Christina would then take the officer to the back of the cemetery, and when asked what was in the ground, she said, quote, bad things, really bad things, and dead and scary things, also snakes and lions and tigers under the dirt, unquote. She spoke of shovels being used to dig up graves. How the hell you gonna have lions and tigers under that dirt, little girl? Please, explain to me how. Another Austin police officer, Sergeant James Beck, arranged for a helicopter to fly over the cemetery with an infrared camera to search for heat emanating from a decomposing body located just below the surface. Officer Beck found some sunken in graves and some fresh dirt. During the Keller's trial, though, the officer would testify that they found graves that had soft dirt about 12 inches down when it should have been hard packed. The evidence presented to Beatrice Christina's bizarre claims relating to burial of bodies in cemeteries, although no bodies were ever found. When news broke out about the allegations, several parents of children who'd taken their kids to the daycare had taken their kids to get interviewed, but investigators could not get any information out of them. Teresa Chambers, who had two kids in the daycare at the Keller's home, told the Chronicle she found no signs that her children had been abused. Police never found any photos or videotape evidence of any form of abuse. The Kellers faced a six-day trial. Christina, who was the first child, claimed in trial that no abuse had taken place, but she had been coached to claim the abuse had occurred. Of course, the only physical evidence was when Suzanne took Christina to the emergency room with Dr. Mu, who, without specialized training, confirmed that there was sexual abuse, but later said he was mistaken as he was not trained in that area and couldn't have made a correct determination that sexual abuse had happened. In August of 1992, a grand jury indicted the couple on charges of sexually assaulting Christina, Brendan, and Vijay, who all attended the daycare. Both Fran and Dan Keller were found guilty and given sentences of 48 years each. Fran Keller would go to prison near Marlin, Texas, while Dan Keller went to a prison near Amarillo, Texas. Now, in 2009, yes, 2009, 17 years later, 17, 1, 7, Jordan Smith, a journalist for the Austin American Statement newspaper, decided to reinvestigate the case. Dr. Mu read the article and strongly suggested that the Kellers were innocent. Mu contacted Smith and recanted his trial testimony. Mu had attended a medical seminar and learned that what he had identified as tears and lacerations to Christina's vagina were in fact normal variations and not the result of sexual abuse. He said he realized that his testimony was not scientifically valid and was a mistake. 
In 2013, Mu signed a sworn statement recanting his trial testimony for attorney Keith Hampton, who began representing Dan and Fran following the publication of the article. Hampton, with the support of Travis County District Attorney's Office, filed a state law petition for a writ of habeas corpus. In addition to Moo's recantation, the petition presented evidence that cemetery employees told police before the trial that the evidence of fresh earth on graves had nothing to do with the Kellers or any bizarre activity. The officer's testimony about the hot spots were false. The trial judge signed a recommendation to the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals that the Keller's convictions be vacated and the charges dismissed. On November 26, 2013, Fran Keller was released from prison. Dan Keller was released December 5, 2013. In May 2015, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals granted the writ and vacated the Keller's conviction. The court, however, declined to find the couple factually innocent. On June 2017, Travis County District Attorney Margaret Moore moved to dismiss the charge and stated, quote, I believe that the defendants are actually innocent of the crime for which each was sentenced, unquote. On June 20th, 2017, the district court granted the motion and declared the Kellers factually innocent. The Kellers seeked $80,000 each for every year they were incarcerated. In August 2017, the state of Texas agreed to pay the couple a total of $3.4 million and a combined annuity of $27,000. Period. Can you imagine? You know, you have this new life and you're like, I'm going to do what I love. And, you know, it, it happened to be taking care of kids for Fran. And, you know, with this whole fucking craze of satanic bullshit that went on. And because of that, and these kids just fucking lying their asses off. Now, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. Of course, it happens. Unfortunately, it happens. And we should take it very, very, very seriously each time it happens. Because we're not victim blaming here and we should not victim blame in any, any situation. Any situation that occurs where there is a victim, it needs to be investigated. No matter what it is and no matter how absurd or how impossible it may seem because expect the impossible shit happens but i mean if you really read back into the allegations that these kids were making it sounds far-fetched as fuck man it sounds so ridiculous that you're just like what obviously you know with christina at first it was kind of different because you know <clears throat> it did seem like she was a victim of sexual abuse in the beginning. But then she started going into these like, well, tires were dug up in here and, you know, they did blood with Kool-Aid and all this other, you know, stuff. And it was like, whoa, 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 what the fuck? But of course, it all came back to those satanic cults that were a thing it was frightening. It, I think Satanism wasn't a really a thing back then. And so if people were really just figuring out what Satanism was and it, Satanism and then turned into something like, oh shit, it's cults. It's natural superpowers. They can do this. They can do that. What else can they do? It's the fear of the unknown. And maybe some of them were false, just like these people. So you get accused and you're like, what the fuck? I didn't do anything. So you're over here saying that you didn't do anything and they sentenced you to 48 years, 48 years. So what, they were probably in their 40s when this happened because now Dan is in his 70s and Fran is in her late 60s. So this was not probably in the 40s. They, it was 20 years. That's 20 years of their life that they were incarcerated and they can't get back. You can't go back in time 
and get 20 years of your fucking life back. That fucking sucks. Yeah, you get $3.4 million, but who the fuck is going to give me my 20 years back that I was incarcerated doing not a goddamn thing because I was innocent? It's one of those cases where it just gets me riled up. It gets me frustrated. But isn't it crazy? Like, it's wild. It's, it was very interesting to me that, you know, people people would be like, oh my god, look at all this shit. Um, it is also said earlier, they had mentioned that Dan was making toys. And so I guess some of the toys the kids could take home. And so the kids would take home like drums and they would take home like Ninja Turtle stuff. And the parents of the children that were making the allegations against the Kellers were like, these toys are satanic. My kid brought home some drums and he was beating on those drums like he was trying to call Satan to our house and I don't know what else. And so it was just, it was just a ridiculous time. But anyways, that was the case of the Oak Hills satanic abuse trial. If you guys like that case, let me know. Uh, let me know what you want to hear next and... Be sure to follow our YouTube channel, 210 Culture, and be put on notifications so that you know when the latest episode of the Texocity series comes out. And with that being said, my name is Donna, and I will see you guys later.